Well, some, some people might disagree, but uh, in my humble opinion, uh, Jesus's Sermon on the Mount is uh, the greatest, I think it's the greatest teaching to fall from the lips of a human being. Uh, it, was, it was spoken by Jesus, of course, um, at the beginning of his ministry. And in many ways, he spent the rest of his ministry reinforcing the truths that he laid out in his Sermon on the Mount. Some people call it his manifesto. Um, and it's famous for so many things. Uh, it's famous for the Beatitudes, the blessed hours of Jesus, those sort of nine pithy statements uh, describing the state of blessedness that we have in Christ. It's famous for those most, uh, the, for the most loved um, prayer of all time, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Some of us, I remember singing that as a little boy at school many years ago. Um, it's also filled with, uh, with statements that really shock, you know, things like if your eye causes you to sin, then pluck it out uh, or, or love your enemies. I mean, it's challenging to hear those words. And of course, the moral commands of Jesus, they, Jesus, they actually make us shudder when we read them, you know, a little bit anyway, concerning lust, anger and, and unfaithfulness. Uh, we could literally pick on any of these things and talk about them for a long time. Uh, but I just want to pick out one little passage from Matthew 7, uh, still part of the Sermon on the Mount, just five verses. I, I really believe they're extremely important. Uh, and I believe that if we take Jesus's teaching in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, if we take it to heart, it can have a dramatic effect on our mental and emotional health. It can, it can actually transform our relationships and it can help us be more, more Christ-like. Um, and I'm going to read them, verses 1 to 5 of chapter 7. A very famous passage says this. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And uh, these verses are often considered among the sort of hard sayings of Jesus. Uh, and like probably most of us, we, we try and avoid those um, or we get worried about them. And um, the thing that I found over the years of uh, reading the Bible and exploring some of these passages is that sometimes the harder things that Jesus seems to say, they actually prove to be the things that are the most life giving. And if you think about the gospel as a good example, I mean, nobody wants to hear that they are living under condemnation and need to repent of their sin. But when we do accept that truth and we do believe what Jesus has said, then we find this amazing new life in Christ. So sometimes the uncomfortable sayings are actually, and I think this is a, a really good example, although we might wince a little bit when we read them or when we hear someone reading them, when we dig in a little bit and when we explore what Jesus is really saying, uh, we find life-giving truth that is really wonderful. And this is a really good example of one of these hard sayings of Jesus that when explored brings something wonderful to our understanding of who God is and of who we are in him. So we're just going to think about these verses for a few minutes. What is Jesus talking about when he says, do not judge or you will be judged? Well, first of all, really helpfully, Jesus provides us with a little parable to illustrate what he was talking about concerning sawdust and or splinters in, in the Greek uh, or, uh, and planks or beams. Um, and, he, and he starts off saying, why do you look at this speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And it's a, it's a really uncomfortable picture, probably because most of all, our eyes are like really sensitive parts of our body. And if anyone has ever had a, a, a splinter or something go into their eye, you'll know that it's really painful. And uh, but Jesus is basically using this parable as a way of describing the behavior of someone 
who is intent on picking up on a small fault in somebody else whilst their own big issue goes unseen and unacknowledged. That's what Jesus seems to be saying. Or, or putting it another way, Jesus is saying, who gives you the authority to find fault with somebody else when your own life is far from perfect? Uh, it's a really uncomfortable question. But this was the sin of the Pharisees, wasn't it? That they were always coming to negative verdicts about those uh, who were around them. Um, and yet, as Jesus put it, they were actually uh, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. That's how I love that scripture. They judged the poor, the sick and the outcast to be outside of the reach of God, outside of the love of God, outside of the compassion of God. And they shunned those people. And in, and in doing so, they saw themselves as worthy and righteous, part of God's in crowd, if you like. And, and Jesus really hated this attitude. He really didn't like this, this sort of pretense of um, religion, which was hiding a lot of stuff that wasn't good. But Jesus, it was completely different for Jesus, wasn't it? Uh, he, he ironically was the only one who was worthy and righteous before God, the only one who ever lived in that way. But he was constantly inviting the poor, the sick, the outcast into the love and the compassion of God so that they could be helped, healed and welcomed into God's big family. Such a massive difference in the two outlooks. And I'm sure like me, uh, you want to be like Jesus. Put your hand up if you want to be like Jesus. Give me a little wave. We, we want to be like Jesus. And the million dollar question, of course, is how do we not judge? How do we not judge? Because if you are like me, then I find myself falling into this attitude really easily as a human being, as a Christian. And um, it's a big question. How do we live our life free from judgment? Um, and to answer this question, let me just suggest, first of all, uh, that we need to understand what's actually happening when we judge. This will turn positive at some point, I promise. But what happens, this is the sort of message Ollie normally speaks on, but <laughs> something, something really meaty and challenging, but really important. What happens when we judge? Um, and the parable again gives us a clue because it makes it clear that when we, judging is something to do with how we see others. Not with our eyes so much as how we see them as a person. What verdict, if you like, we come to about them, uh, how we see what they do or how they look. And in the end, sometimes after only a few seconds, we come to a conclusion in our hearts and in our minds about them. And we, we make up our minds what, what they are like, um, what their motives are, what sort of person they are. And once we've got this little picture of them, we carry that around with us. Whenever we see them, we see this person in this light of how we've come to perceive them to be. And the way we interact with them or don't interact with them, as the case of the Pharisees was, the way we interact with them is shaped by how we've seen them and the, the ideas that we formed about them. And we end up sort of seeing people through a sort of blurry vision in a blurry way. And it's, we relate out of a whole bunch of assumptions and even guesses about them. Maybe we've met someone we think was like them before. And we have this sort of blurry way of looking at them. And potentially right there is a whole world of pain for us that Jesus doesn't want us. He wants us to avoid. This is why he's telling us this, because the way of judgment is a way of pain when we live like this. So how do we fall? This is the big question. How do we not judge others? Um, how can we avoid falling into this type of behavior? Jesus gives us the answer. He says, you hypocrites, first take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye or your sister's eye. 
And like, this is a great piece of advice Jesus is giving us here. We've got to get rid of the thing in our eye so that we can see people clearly. God wants me to see you clearly. And he wants me to see you in a way that's free from my self-made conceptions. And he wants them moved out of the way. And he wants me to discover how he sees you, how God sees you, Richard, how, how God sees you, Jess. And um, as we discover the way that God sees other people, then we can actually help them with the thing that's causing them pain, the splinter in their eye. And I think it's because people behave the, the way that they do so often, and we, you know, we might, we might um, not cope with the way some people behave, but often people behave the way they do because they've got some unresolved pain in their life. There's pain in their life that's shaping how they behave. And Jesus, I love this about Jesus. Jesus was always helping people with their pain. He was always helping people with their pain. He was helping them with their physical pain. He was helping them with their emotional pain. He was helping them with their mental pain and even their spiritual pain. I think there's probably such a thing. Jesus was concerned to deal with the pain in people's lives. But he was making the point that you can't help people you can't deal with people's pain if you're judging them if you're not seeing them properly and what Jesus did was that he saw people properly he saw people the way that the father saw people the father's way of seeing everybody that's great Roger but you still haven't told us what the answer to the question is how do we get the plank, the beam, the log, however you want to interpret it? How do we get it out of our eye? How do we get free of judging? And th does it mean, this is the thing I used to always think, maybe if I'm perfect, if I live a perfect life, if I'm a really good Christian, if I'm like Jesus, maybe then I'm in a position where I can help someone with their pain. But what happens is you just end up in a different type of Pharisaism where it's about your efforts to be right and I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all let me tell you at last what is Jesus saying I'm going to put this really plainly I think Jesus is saying this in this passage if we want to if we want to stop judging others then we have to stop judging ourselves first I'm going to say that again this is really important if we want to stop living in judgment of others then we have to first stop living in judgment of ourselves. And the two things that I believe they're completely interdependent. And Paul said in Corinthians, he said, I do not even judge myself. And I think this is what it's about. It's why Jesus is describing this thing in our eye as a log or a beam. It's this big thing in our life that we get to see all the time. If we're honest, we see our flaws, we see our faults, we see our shortcomings, our selfishness, our greed, and we judge ourselves for it. We can even shun ourselves the way we are, and we can exclude ourselves from that welcoming presence of God and his place, a place of love and peace in him. And it's not that God doesn't care about those things in us, but I really believe that God wants to change our perspective of how we see ourselves and how we see our problems. And he wants us to see ourselves with his eyes. He wants us to see my problems. Not, he doesn't want you to see my problems. They might already be obvious. He, he wants me to see my problems from his perspective. And the, this is the shock of the verse. This is the shock of what Jesus is saying, that how we see ourselves shapes how we see others how i see myself shapes how i see other people and when we judge someone we step out of that realm of grace and we put ourselves in a place of judgment and by condemning others we actually just end up condemning ourselves because we're we're just as bad as anybody else but when we take the log out of our eye we take the log out of our, our eye, but this is so important, by ceasing self-judgment. We've got to stop judging ourselves. And we've got to let God be the one who decides who we are. And we've got to let God 
define our identity and our view of ourselves and believe what God says about me. We need to let God's view of, of Roger Wyatt to shape how Roger Wyatt sees Roger Wyatt. Does that make sense? I hope so. And when I start to believe that I'm loved, when I start to believe that I'm accepted despite all of my stuff, when I start to believe that I am special, that I'm a son of the living God, that I'm favoured by my father, that he has mercy for me and grace for me and time for me, and that he cares about me and he provides me. When I start to believe those things about myself, then I start to believe them about you too. Because in the way that I see myself dictates the way that I see you. If God's like that with me, he's like it with Joe McCann. He's like it with Sarah Baggett. Sorry, I know Baggett's not your name anymore, but it's up there. So this is my encouragement to you this morning. Be shaped by how God sees you, not by anything else. And let me just tell you this. God does not see us the way we see ourselves. God doesn't see Roger Wyatt the way that Roger Wyatt sees himself. He sees us differently. And it's a journey that we have to go on to discover how God sees me. We've got to go on that journey. It takes time for the truths of God to get down into the depths and core and roots of our being as we begin to understand that God sees Abby Wyatt like she is the best thing on the planet. I can say that as she's my daughter, I know I have that same sense of the heart of God for her. I just know that he thinks that Gaz Logan is just the spice of life. <laughs> that he's the best. And that God is proud of him. God is so proud of Gaz Logan. And when Gaz wakes up in the morning, so I don't embarrass you, Gaz, that the father is excited. He's really excited. He's like, yes, Gaz is up. <laughs> I'm getting carried away. Be shaped by how God sees you, Karina. And I really believe that when we, when we let that happen, as I said at the beginning, it has a dramatic effect on our mental and emotional health. Because a lot of people, I'm finishing, but a lot of people spend a lot of time beating themselves up and condemning themselves and putting themselves down and thinking they're no good. And like in those situations that, that Caitlin mentioned, things happen around us that make us feel like we're worthless. But God says, Caitlin, you are not worthless. You're my precious daughter and I'm going to lift you up and you are not going to be put to shame. It has a dramatic effect on our mental, emotional health. It, it transforms our relationships because when we're living in judgment of somebody else, we can't know them and they can't know us. Big barriers get thrown up. But when we release them and see them as God sees them, we start to love them and appreciate them in new ways. And finally, it helps us to be more Christ-like because that's how Christ de dealt with people. That's how he dealt with me. That's how he dealt with you. And as we receive that from him, we can start to deal with others in the same way. And we can welcome the poor. We can welcome the broken. We can wel welcome those that are lost. And like Mandy said, those that are burdened into the wonderful family of God. Amen. That's my thoughts. I'm going to pray. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray a bit of a sort of gritty prayer and we're going to ask God to forgive us for judging ourselves and I, I, I think this is something that we need to do and I, I, I need to do and then I'm going to ask God to forgive us for judging others but I think it's in that order so let's just pray thank you father thank you that you're here father Thank you that you're present, Lord, with each of us right now. And Lord, I just know that you love each of us so much, that we are so precious to you. And Lord, when we hate what you love, it really grieves your heart. And Lord, I just want to confess my own sin of judging myself, of putting myself down, of condemning myself, even cursing myself at times, Lord. 
I confess that to you, Lord. I repent of that and I ask you to forgive me. And I know that every person listening will just be echoing this prayer in their own way, Lord, that you'd forgive me, Lord, for judging myself. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me to see you, see myself as you see me, Lord, that I, my life might be shaped by your view of me and not by my own view of me. And Lord, I also just extend that out, Lord, and say, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, that I've not seen others in the way that you have seen them, Lord, and that I've judged others. And Lord, I've just had a big beam in my, in my, in my eye, Lord. And Lord, I'm just sorry about that, Lord. And I know that each person here is just going to amen that in their own way, Lord. So thank you, Lord. Thank you that you want you. This is such good news, Lord. You want us to see ourselves as loved and as precious and as set apart and as special and favoured and chosen. And I pray that revelation would just really get hold of our hearts this week, Lord, and would just fill us and transform us and transform our relationships in Jesus name. Amen.